Hi, it's Neil Sean here on Your Entertainment News. I am thrilled today to say that my guest is the one and only, the man that you've seen so much of and written so many famous theme tunes for, the wonderful Mr. Laurie Holloway, MBE, no less. Remember, though, Laurie, if you miss it, you'll miss out. <laughs> you heard it from the man himself. Don't miss Laurie Holloway today on Be My Guest. Laurie, lovely to finally meet you at last. I'm so thrilled you're here. Uh, fabulous collection of um, CDs and you've done so much. But let's kick off from the start. Right. An olden boy, yes. how did you, at what point did you realise that this was the career that you wanted? How did it all evolve, which always fascinates me? Well, I was, I did GCEs at 16 and I got a proper job. I was an apprentice draftsman because <laughs> my dad said, get a proper job. Get a proper job, yeah. But, from about 14, I'd been doing Saturday night hops with a local band, earning, what, more than I was getting as a draftsman. Yeah. I became a friendly with a chap in the, uh, the Savoy Ballroom Oldham, and he came in one day and said, there's a bloke looking for a piano player. I said, right, that's me. He said, your dad won't like it. I <laughs> said, well, I'm sorry, but I'm going. And I went with Sid Wilmot when I was 16, to Weymouth, and that was the start of my career. Wow. But I was very green. Yeah, yeah. And I, through experience with Sid, he was, by the way, he was the um, surprise on my This Is Your Life. Oh, wow. But they didn't know that he'd actually fired me. <laughs> so I might have punched him as he came out. <laughs> I love the way you said the Savoy. Hold him. Um, <laughs> you know, he's got that like sort of, yeah, you think, oh, really, Savoy Ballroom. <laughs> and so at that point, though, you, you know, you're starting out and it's great and everything. But did you sort of think to yourself, uh, you know, was there any point where um, you thought, oh, this is nice for now, but I, I might have to get a proper job? Or did, were you that determined? You thought, I am doing this, you know? Oh, that was me for the rest of my life. Wow. It was a fantastic life because... You only did 7.30 till 11 at night, playing the piano, yeah. lying in in the morning, going to the pictures in the afternoon. And I thought, this is fantastic. <laughs> and you get paid at the end of the week. Yeah, I yeah. sent seven pounds a week home to my mother. Yeah. And I kept a bit of pocket money. Yeah, a good boy, you see. <laughs> and, and who was responsible for teaching you? You know, the, the, ah, yeah. did you sort of just... Well, I suppose what I'm asking, Laurie, is did you... When you sat down, did you instantly think, oh, I've got a knack for this, or was it in the family? Was somebody else genetically musical? We were very fortunate for two things. Number one, we had a piano. Not yeah. everybody had no, a piano. No, it was a luxury in a way. Yeah. yeah. And my dad played by ear. I've got an older brother who also played, but he was 12 years older, so I don't remember much about that. And he's, it was his birthday the other day, he's 92. Wow. Fit as a fiddle. But I went to a teacher down the road... Mr. Emmett, from being <laughs> 7 to 11. You never forget them, do you? No. <laughs> he was marvellous. And the good thing about it was that he taught me theory of music before he let me touch the piano. I, I knew what the notes were yeah. on, the, on the clefs. And um, at 11, he said, that's it. I can't teach you anymore. So my aunt then found me a classical teacher, Miss Starkey. <laughs> and I went from 11 to 16 until I turned pro. Wow. Learning classical music, which held me in good stead. So I only had two teachers, but they were brilliant, both of them. Do you know, I'm glad you've touched on classical, because all great musicians that I've met, um, they all do have that classical background. I, I, for instance, Neil Sedaka, who I think is a very brilliant songwriter, yeah. but he, you know, the background he was on was classical. Do you think that's the key to, you know, in later life, even when you want to become commercial popular, you know? Well, if you, if you do what I did, that was, went into studios, you'd go in at 10 in the morning and they put the music in front of you. So you have to read it. And being a classical musician, classically trained, you can, and yeah. because of Mr. Emmett, when I was seven, teaching me to read music, it's, it's, you have to, to yeah. be, in those days, a studio musician. Yeah. I think it's changed a lot, actually. Yeah, yeah. You'd go in and play three chords on your guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you, so you, you've now gone professional. Yeah. And you're having a cracking time, going to the pictures, <laughs> and having a line in the morning. What was then your next big break in your mind? What was the key that, you know, then opened another door, as it were? Okay. 
as I said before, this man need have fired me because yeah. he had his drinking <laughs> partner had recovered. And I had to, and those days there were two ballrooms in every town. It's like a football team. Yeah. You get transferred to good. And I was recommended by somebody to go to Arthur Plant, which was a jazz band in Dundee. And I went up there and it was fantastic. And now I'm playing jazz, Billy yeah. May arrangements and Nelson Riddle arrangements. And we got fired from that as well because <laughs> it was supposed to be dance music. Do you ever think there's a train going here? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was the last time. So we auditioned for Mr. Geraldo, who was the musical yeah. director of Cunard. Yeah. And we got the job. And I went on the boats for a year. Wow. And incidentally, a steward on the boat, who is now a good friend of mine, was John Prescott. Oh. On the same ship. Same, he was, yeah, 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 yeah. Same time, yeah. yeah. We didn't meet then. But people say, how do you two know each other? Because we are a bit desperate, yeah, you know. Yeah. I say, well, we're on the same ship together. I was a piano player and he was a waiter. And then he became a shop steward and then he became a member of parliament. Then he became deputy prime minister. Then he became Lord Prescott. Yeah. I'm still a piano player. <laughs> <laughs> he quite likes that. You've not done bad, though, have you? <laughs> <laughs> so oh. I'm, I'm now on Cunard Line. Yeah. And I left that and tried my luck in London and became the piano player with Ronnie Rand at the Astoria, Charing Cross Road. Where was that then in, in Charing Cross Road? It was right at the top near Tottenham Oh, Corner. do you yeah. mean the, the, uh, the one on the corner that they've knocked down for the crossrail? That's yeah. right, yeah. It was a cinema and then... That's yeah, right. Yeah, 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 a nightclub in the old way. Yeah. Yeah. So we used to do tea music, two bands, revolving stage, you know, in those days. Wow. And I used to do 2.30 till 6.00. 7.30 to 10.30, the clock was five minutes fast, so I finished at 10.25, and I started a nightclub at 10.30 around the corner, the Gargoyle, wow. till 3.15 a.m. So I was working 2.30 p.m. to 3.15 a.m. Having a great time. Yeah. I learned so many tunes. It's not work, though, is it, if you love it? That's no, the thing. great. Because it is, I mean, you're in the centre of London. Yeah. You've come now from Oldham. You're now in the, I mean, it's the golden period of, of nightclubs and, yeah. you know, all that sort of glamour. And so when you when you got into this thing again, you know, it seems to me that when you meet successful people like yourself, it is, whatever people say, it's the right place at the right time. Yeah. You, you're now connecting to you. different people and, you know, because you could have just stayed up back home in I the could. Savoy Ballroom, couldn't you? And, and been a draftsman. Carried on, yeah. Or being a draftsman, yeah. <laughs> so then, when you, because when I, I look at your CV, Laura, you've done so much. I mean, you really have. And when I, I look at the greats that you played, you know, with and, and yeah. helped and yeah. everything like that, you, you, what I love about you, you're very respectful of their memory and, you know, who they are and stuff like yeah. that. And we interviewed recently um, a guy, and, and I don't know if you know him, but he was called Linford Hudson. And he was a spotlight man yeah. uh, at the London Palladium for like 50 years. Oh, well, I Incredible think I saw guy. this, yeah. Yeah, brilliant guy. Yeah. And he did the spotlight when you were with Judy Garland right. um, and he brought it down to the pin and he was very keen to tell it, you know. Yeah. I mean, and he was young. Yeah. And I was saying to him, you must have been really nervous, you know, I major wasn't. star and, and, you know, all this. But what was she, you know, because you, I think singers and musical directors have a very close, they need you. Yeah. And you're more powerful in a lot of ways than you them. are. You are. Uh, what was it like with her, you know, for instance? Well, I was asked to help her to get ready for this show at the Palladium. My show was at the Palladium. And I used to go along. She'd hired a house, rented a house in Chelsea. I used to go along at 11 in the morning. We would rehearse, have lunch, rehearse, go out in the evening. We used to go to Daniel the Rose Club a lot. Winston's. Was it Winston's? Was it Winston's? Or was he called? No, no, there was Ronnie another. Corbett was in yeah. there. And, and yeah, yeah, so it might have been LaRue's or whatever it was called, yeah. I think it was Hanover Square yeah. or something like that. Posh place. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, we, uh, we had a great time for six weeks. Liza as well. Wow. And then we did these shows at the Palladium. And that, she was a friend of mine. Yeah. But... You are respectful, yeah. you know, you, you can't take liberties. In fact, after, long after that, between 70 and 75, 1970 and 75, I was with Engelbert. Wow. And I was his musical director, companion, arranger. But as soon as you get into public, he's Engelbert Humperdinck. Yeah. And you have to treat him as the star he was. On the, on the plane, give us another champagne. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, just to go back to to you, you, with Judy at the Palladium because th this is a huge break for you. I mean, you know, she's major. Yeah. 
were you, Laurie, were you nervous? You know, because uh, you, you're young, you know what I mean? You're still yeah. very young. And then there's a big theatre and she's a big star and it's filmed as well. And there's I all think I was 24, oh, 26. She's mega young, nervous. isn't he? I wasn't nervous in the least. Really? I really enjoyed it. In fact, it's one of the few gigs where it started the overture and uh, over the rainbow and the hair started yeah. moving on your neck. You know, it's fantastic. Yeah. It was really good. I enjoyed it. I wasn't nervous. And, and as, a, as, a, as an act, because we always see the negative of, you know, oh, you read about the negative, Judy Garland. And I've been lucky enough to, to meet Liza and, and Lorna. Uh, but I always think great artists, you expect them to be slightly, I hate the word nutty, but do you know what I mean? Like, out there. Uh, because they know when that light hits, when that spotlight comes on, yeah. they have to deliver. Absolutely. You know, as much yeah. as you do, but they, everybody's watching them walk to that microphone. Yeah, they're, and in, they're, they're in front. Yeah, they've got to come on and deliver it. What was, you know, when you say you had lunch and things like that together, was she erratic or was she together? Was she more, is that an image that they projected, do you think, that helped sell them? She seemed very together at that time. She, when she came down in the, in the morning with a glass of water, you're not yeah. sure it's water. Oh, really? <laughs> but you're young because you don't know, do you? That's the thing. No, about that's that. right. Do you yeah. know, really? <laughs> no, I wasn't terribly impressed because mm. I was so young. Yeah. If I, would, if I did it now with Judy Garland, I'd yeah. be impressed. And, I'd know what a record, a past yeah. record was. No, I wasn't. But um, everybody that I've worked with, I've had great respect for because they, the one, they are the ones that have to go out and do yeah. it. I've always been a background person, yeah. and I love being a background person because I was important, but not having to do it. Yeah, yeah. I was with Elaine Page for five years, and we had a great time. Yeah. But she's the one that had to sit, go out front and, and face everybody. Recently, I've become more of a front person. Yeah. And I find I get very nervous doing that. Oh, really? Yeah. You see, I because I, I I think, you know, it's a there's a great thing about when you're in a band. There's this camaraderie, isn't there? You know, yeah. you, you've got yeah. your you're a group. You've got your and mates you've all there, gotta, yeah. yeah, you've got to work to get it right. And I often think as well, when you say, as you rightly said, Elaine Page is a lovely lady and she's been here a few times. And, um, you can feel, when you're on that stage, you can feel the warmth for that artist, can't you? Because yeah. they, yeah. they, they want her to succeed, you yeah, know. Absolutely. Sometimes yeah. when you get an, an act and the audience is slightly turned yeah. and we've all yeah. been there, you think, tricky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and they're not aware of it either, the artist. They think they yeah. just can keep these people waiting and it's going to work. Yeah. But I, you must have seen a lot of things where you know, when they've come on, they instantly, you know, it's going to be a brilliant night. And, and you know, you going through the repertoire of their song. Yeah, yeah. When, when you're trying to get, the other side that I wanted to know is when you're yourself and you are, because you, I was amazed that when I was looking at what you've done, you've written some of the most popular TV theme tunes. And I read some of them, you said, oh, well, you know, they, they, they're not necessarily this, but, you know, they're, they're, they're commercial or something. But I think that's, wrong because we all know these tunes well you know and they stick in your conscious don't I they? had a hot spell yeah um, and I wrote fairly simple things I always say it's not culture but it's it's, an, yeah. it's a good earner I wrote blind date um, game for a laugh watch out Beatles about child's play uh, Maggie and her lo lots of things what happens is I, I was friendly with the producer, Alan Boyd. Yeah. I was his man. He was a big, big guy at LWT at the time. LWT. Wasn't he? Yeah. And whenever a new series came up, I would be asked to write the music. So on. That's why I did so many yeah. in such a, that short time. But then Alan retired. Another man comes in, and he's got his own man. Yeah. So, you you're hot for a while, yeah. then it then yeah. it tapers off. When, when you did say, like, Blind Date, I'm always curious because um, another really good friend of mine is, uh, I think he's brilliant, Tony Hatch, who's also done a lot of theme That's tunes. Right, yeah. And I remember saying to him, like, when they came with the concept of the show, have you seen the show or do they just sketchily tell you it? You know, like, had you ever yeah. seen an episode of Blind Date no. and then wrote the tune or you wrote the tune and said, there you go? He told me, Alan told me, it was, it was based on an, an American series called The Dating Game. Yeah. So I got The Dating Game and it opened up with a song. So I wrote a song called We're Going on a Blind Date. And he said, ooh, don't like that. <laughs> Have you got anything else? So I just went, da-da, da-da. And he said, that's it, catchy. 
Wow. And the same with Beatles. About he called me and he said, well, I knew Jeremy because he was in Game From Love yeah. with Sarah Kennedy, yeah. Matthew Kelly and Henry Kelly. And they, that was a massive Saturday night show. Yeah. It's hard to imagine the audiences that you got then because, yeah. you know, I think Blind Date was 15, 18, 22 million at points, wasn't it? Was now, it? <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't get that now. You no, know, it's on again five. now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and which is great, you know, for you. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I kind of think it's like, you know, now to get, as you say, punchlines and all those things you've done. Yeah. It's hard to imagine everybody sat down and watched those That's programs. Right. Well, there were only a few channels in those yeah. things, weren't there? Yeah, yeah. Now you've got 150 or something. Yeah, with nothing but, on. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Alan called me in and said, we're doing this series with Jeremy, and it's going to be called Watch Out Beatles About. Will you write the signature? And I said, yeah, go and have a cup of tea. So we went and had a cup of tea, and I wrote, watch out, Beatles, and uh, Dad Shoon. Yeah. Da -da -da. He said, that's great. Have you got any lyrics? I said, go and have another cup of tea. <laughs> so I said, when they came out, I said, I've written something that's it's almost Shakespearean. It's watch out, Beatles about. Watch out, Beatles about. You better watch out, because Beatles <laughs> about. <laughs> you got the title in, yeah, yeah. it? Yeah. Is that the key then when you're writing something like that? Is it like, because I think now um, you don't get this so much now with TV programs because they don't rely on a theme. They have to go straight into the, the cut of the show, don't they? Yeah. But you know, back then, the, 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 um, the intro of a show, if you were in the kitchen, you knew it started. Coronation so Street. That's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. Da, 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 yeah. Da, 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 da. I've been going yeah. for 50 years on it. Yeah, yeah. But if you play Blind Date in the in the kitchen, they know that it's yeah. on. They know Was that program. the sort of thing that you would, in your mind, thinking, I've got to get this stamped, that people know straight away when, when the show starts? No, it wasn't a, a reason for doing it. Oh. I just did. I just took the title, Blind Date. Yeah. Da, 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 da. So it's, that's a gift, though, isn't it, Laurie? Because, I mean, you know, you, you make it sound so simple, like you just go for a cup of tea and I'll, <laughs> I'll come back with this. I couldn't do that if you left me for 20 cups of tea, you know what I mean? <laughs> I just wouldn't know where to start. I'd, I'd panic it if he said to me, oh, have you got anything else? I, that would be it. I think when well, I brought you that, yeah, yeah. you know, so as a musician, that, that's another gift that you you can think, well, OK, yeah. we'll, we'll start yeah. that and do that again. But I don't write. I'm, I'm writing at the moment with Barry Mason, who wrote Delilah oh, yeah, and The Last yeah, Waltz. Yeah. He's a wonderful lyricist, but I can't write a, a hit tune these days because oh. they're not. Maybe in the fifties or sixties I could have done, yeah. but they're not stories these days, are they? They're just a sound, I think. I think it's coming back though because Bradley Walsh, you know, the game show host, yeah. he had a big album last year, and the number one, the biggest selling male album, really? uh, yes, through simply just putting out an album of good covers with a nice orchestra. And he looks the part and, you know, yeah. it worked. Yeah. And now we've got quite a few of these other people, you know, um, TV hosts having a go. Yeah. Um, and I think it all goes in circles. And, and I think you're, you think you're possibly wrong. I think tunes, you, are it's come, tunes are coming back. Yeah. Because I think they realise that, well, if you're on telly and you can get 10 million people to watch yeah. The Chase or whatever, right. maybe they'll buy an album. And so I think it does... You should send it to um I'm like, I was second, to second coming. <laughs> <laughs> so out of all tell me, out of all the ladies and, and, and people that you know you've been um, M D for and, and yeah. you know, played with, who have you enjoyed apart from of course uh, you, you know um, I, I as I said I, I loved your wife, Mary Montgomery. Yeah. A, a beautiful voice, yeah, uh, very distinctive. And I think I always say this to people, of people of that generation, when you had um singers in that time whether it be like Scylla, Sandy, Dusty, they all had a very they individual them. voice. You know, right. you knew when that song came in the radio, that's yeah. Sandy Shaw, that's Scylla, yeah. you know. Um, did you, do you know, were the people that you've worked with, do you look for that in a singer when you're working with them? When I'm, when I'm working with people, I like to be able to recognise the voice. I've worked with Cleo Lane. Yeah, oh, lovely. There's only one person who sounds like Cleo, yeah. and that's her daughter, Jackie. Yeah. Jackie yeah. Dankworth sounds exactly like her mother. Yeah. And uh, you see, I was asked to work with Streisand. Wow. Now, I've got to confess that I didn't like her voice. So You're I, a brave man, Laurie. I turned it down. <laughs> I turned it down. Wow. But I I'd thought, love to have known that phone call or whoever told her that. I, t I told Judy Garland this and she thought I was wonderful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why did you turn it down? Because you just didn't like the voice. I thought she had a voice like that, that yeah. thin. Instead of that wide, yeah, and 
it is fairly piercing, I must admit. Yeah. Anyway, I was a bit stroppy in those days. Because you know, it's funny actually you say that because there's a great piece of footage online where there's Ethel Merman, Judy Garland, and Barbara Streisand. Yeah. And um, and you, you should watch this. It's fascinating because as somebody who does what you do, you love it. You can see them all, you know, all chums at the beginning. But by the end of the song, they're all fighting for the best note, the best yeah, movement, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. And you're watching, and, and Judy wins. Does she? You yeah. know, <laughs> she just takes over somehow yeah. and puts her arm over everybody else. And yeah. All the tricks are going off. And that, again, that fascinates me from your job, because say with the male people that you've worked for, who have you enjoyed, you know, yourself, you know, working with? I mean, I love Engelbert, but there's so Mel many. Mel Torme. He had a, a very distinctive voice. Fantastic. Uh, the Velvet Fog, he was known as. Oh. <laughs> and I've been working with his son, James, recently. Oh. But Mel Tommy was so musical. He was a bit of a clever clock. Yeah. But he, we did a club called The Cool Elephant. And he asked for requests once. And somebody shouted some title. He said, yeah, that's great. We'll do that, Laurie. I said, I don't know it, Mel. <laughs> he said, you will in a minute. Oh, and he really? sang arpeggio. So I knew uh, what the chords were. Yeah. Quite fantastic, though. I'll tell you, I, I did a lot of television sh shows with Val Dunican. I loved Val Dunican. He was lovely. He, Very people, nice. Just to remind people, Laurie, he was so huge, wasn't he, in the yeah. 70s? Oh, massive, yeah. You just couldn't believe how big Sunday night was. television. Yeah, yeah. And, and he told me a brilliant story once, and I don't know whether this is true, he's pulling my leg, but he said when the BBC came to do his Christmas special, he let them film it in his house because they decorated it with all, yeah. with all the stuff for free. <laughs> and then they left and he said, well, the house is decorated now for Christmas, you know. <laughs> but Val, it's hard to imagine now because you wonder whether he would take off in today's world because he was just very affable, yeah. uh, lovely singer, warm personality. Nice no, sweaters and the all rocking the chair. Yeah, rocking. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, the rocking chair. No good, chair. nothing now. Nothing yeah. Now. And it's, uh, so what was it about him that you liked? He was a nice bloke. Yeah. And we played golf together. Right, yeah. And he so. was a very good golfer. Yeah. And he was musical. And he was, he, it's unusual to get those combinations of n niceness yeah. and talent as well. Yeah. He was yeah. great. But I worked with Bernie Flint as well. Do you remember? Bernie? Oh, I don't want to put a hold on you. I Opportunity did the, not. I yeah. did the chart on that for that. Wow, really? Because yeah. that was massive again. You know, it's like, yeah. it's funny, isn't it? We talk about talent shows and stuff, but I remember him winning that yeah. as, a, as a kid watching it. And thinking to myself how amazing it was that he, he won the show and then he, he was in the shops. You yeah, know? I know it sounds right. silly now, but the picture back I think back on the show he just played guitar, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. And then I was asked to take care of him and we did an album and it was I, I Don't Want to Put a Hold on You. Yeah. And I, I got a big string section. And it was top of the hit parade, I yeah. think, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, I remember by yeah, it, yeah, I, Because it, that was the power of telly then, wasn't it? You know, yeah, he was, it was. a good-looking lad, and, yeah. and he'd won this show, and, and, you know, you didn't have all this phoning. Yeah. I mean, it was ridiculous when you think now, opportunity to you roll in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Can you> imagine? <laughs> Going back to the girl singers, I was approached once. Somebody had a bright idea. There were three tenors. Oh, yes. Three dames. What a good idea. Oh, yeah, brilliant idea. Who went, yeah, right, I'll, you're starter for ten. Where were the three dames? Well, Dame Kiri Takanawa Correct. would be one. Uh, do you know now? I can't think of a name. Dame Cleo Lane, Dame Shirley yeah. Bassey. Yeah, oh yeah. Right, so I, I rehearsed Ooh, Kiri. Wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be in that room. <laughs> I rehearsed Cleo and I went to Monte Carlo to rehearse Shirley. Yeah. Fantastic. Cleo was going to sing opera. Yeah. Kiri was going to sing a bit of jazz. Uh, Shirley was going to sing anything she wanted. Really. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then I got a phone call. I'd done all this work. Phone call. It's off. I won't say who, but one of them wanted more than a third. Mm -hmm. So it was all cancelled. I said, I'll tell you what, get rid of her and get Dame Edna. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. <laughs> isn't it, do, just, do, on a serious note for that, doesn't that make you sad that the, the silliness lost that great project? Because now yeah, it, was it would be, it? It could, you could still keep remastering it and taking it out to new fans. Different dames. Yeah, yeah. And, and a wonderful idea. Yeah. Gosh. It's a shame, isn't it? And then, so, but, so Dame Shirley Bassey, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would say, I mean, to me, one of our biggest stars. Yeah. I mean, I'm amazed. Yeah. The thing that I'm always amazed about her, to be honest, is that she didn't progress into, like, film or... I know she was up for Oliver at the time, I think, with Nancy. Yeah. And she didn't get that. But, I mean, what an, what an incredible performer. Is that what you she got She was when like a Dorothy Squires, in a, way, in a way, wasn't she? Yeah. She's larger than life. Yeah. 
and she, you could tell it's her singing. That's yeah. another thing. Yeah, definitely. And uh, she was bolshy, and she she got on with it, and she was fantastic. Were you nervous with people like that, though? Or have you always had this? Because you you've got a very calm demeanour, you know. So like, I would when. Uh, between you and I now, sometimes when you interview <laughs> people, you know, especially when they come with a reputation, yeah. sometimes you get this thing where you think, oh, I wonder what they're going to be like, you know, when they walk in. Yeah. Even though they're here to promote, it's not always, as you know, mm -hmm. the way that it goes, you know. So you, you work at it and the, the, the eventually you're warm to you. But when you're going in there, is that, do you think that's taken away for you because you are the musical director and they want to sound good and you yeah. can make yeah. them sound good? Well, I was never nervous because I was playing the piano yeah. and I knew I was pretty good at that as an accompanist. I've always been an accompanist yeah. rather than a soloist. And with Shirley, it was her and me in this room and we sang, um, isn't it rich? What's that? Oh, yeah, isn't it rich? I'll be a piano. You were the last on the ground. Me and me. Oh, Sending the Clowns. Sending the Clowns. Yeah. And again, the hairs were standing up on the yeah. back of my neck. Just her and me. What a performance to be in. She yeah. performed it. Which yeah. She didn't have to, yeah. but she did for herself, I suppose. Yeah. And it was marvellous. It's a shame yeah. that whole thing fell down, fell down. See, that's, that's what's lovely when you meet people like yourself because it's projects that you don't know about. Yeah. And you think afterwards, gosh, you know, as you say, you're running. Maybe you could still do it. Yeah. I, I, do you know what? I still think that would work because I think nowadays people, I go back to this thing of, um, you know, I, I'm lucky, I come from a theatrical background. And years ago, you could just have one star, but now people want value, so they yeah. do want three, you know, and yeah. it doesn't matter what you're doing, you have to put three or put two or something. Yeah. I think that's why Michael Ball and, and um, Alfie Ball have done well. That's right. Because they've both got fans, but combined, yeah. they've got a lot of fans, yeah. and, and it works, you know, incredible. Alfie's done very well, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I played for him at Sir Michael's Pub once oh, wow. with my trio when he was just becoming known yeah oh, and he's yeah. done really well i mean you touched on that parkinson again a massive chat show yeah uh, i mean now i mean i was very envious of michael parkinson because not only do i think he's a great interviewer and he's you know inspiration but um he just got the the, the golden period of people didn't he i mean yeah. even in you know in the later shows there were still greats around yeah. he let them um, talk didn't he yeah yeah and also it's one of the few jobs where the band got bigger yeah <laughs> they normally go <laughs> Finish up doing it on yeah. your own. I, carry, I started with a quintet, I think. He said, would you like a bigger band? I said, yeah. So I went to 10, and then about a bit later he said, I think we should have a big band, don't you? I said, yeah. So we went to 16. Maybe that's why the show folded. <laughs> I, I think, no, I think, I think it's probably because in the end, he'd really met everybody worthwhile. Yeah. I mean, when you're doing a chat show now, I find it very hard on TV. Because the, the the audience, my argument is the audience would see, and I'm not just saying this, but people like yourself who've got a story, and then you know you bring on a pop star who just sits there yeah. filing their nails, basically. That's right. Yeah. Like, okay, what would we do now? <laughs> well, towards the end, when we were redundant, really, we yeah. played him on the down the steps. Yeah. We played the the, the big stars on. Yeah. And then when he had any music, it was usually a self-contained group. Yeah. So we would go off and have a drink in the green room. Who was the people that you met on those shows that you liked? Was there any childhood person that you, you know, you met? I remember meeting Tony Curtis, and I couldn't quite believe it. Do you know what I mean? When you sit in opposite him, you think, wow. Well, Dame Edna was on a lot. Oh, I love Dame Edna. And I worked uh, since 1983 with uh, Barry Humphreys. Yeah. We would travel up north, say, Barry yeah. and Laurie in the yeah. car, and uh, having chat. Get to the gig, and he would start turning into Dame Edna. Oh. And I had to call him Edna, not Barry. And he, she would say, Laurie, I haven't seen you for such a long time. I said, we've just been, um, better not. Yeah. Because he had to have that persona. You know. Oh, so, you did, so it's interesting. That's a very interesting moment because you wonder at what point do they get into character? You know, you read about these people saying, nobody to come into my dressing room for yeah. an hour before. Well, yeah. you know, and then they create the character. So yeah. he started it literally going towards As soon as he put his frock on, wow. I would avert my eyes, you know, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, Dave Ender Everidge is still, I mean, um, uh, to me, again, a massive comic creation. When he came on and you're there, you again, you're talking about feeling the warmth of an audience. Yeah. They it, it just loved him. They did, yeah. Just loved him, didn't they? You, you know? shouldn't see it. When he does Celeste, yeah. 
he shouldn't sit in the front three no. rows. <laughs> <laughs> and now, so Les, although I think it's fabulous, he's so on PC. He was on PC anyway, wasn't he? Yeah. But it's so on PC now. You wonder if he could get away. Yeah. You know, I don't think TV would put that character no, they on now. No. Which is a shame because yeah. funny's funny, isn't it? You know. Yeah. Yeah. Let me touch quickly also on, um, uh, you know, one of the biggest shows I think of the last twenty years, really. Uh, Strictly Come Dancing. Yeah. How did you get involved with that? And what, did you believe it could be successful again? Because it all loved. I loved Come Dancing. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you remember with like Terry Wogan, Angela Rip, and Katie Boyle? Yeah, I like right, looking yeah. at the ballroom. You know, I think yeah. well, that's nice. You know, yeah. I mean, when they told you it, did you think this is going to be successful? Or? Right. I had an agent called Anne Zahl, who um, I was the only big band on television doing Parkinson. Yeah. And Strictly Come Dancing was an idea. And they thought, well, we need a big band. Who's a big band leader? Laurie Holloway. And Anne said, they want you to do this strictly. I said, I'm not a band leader. I'm not a dance band leader. Yeah. I'm a jazz band leader or a big band leader. Well, she said, well, give it a go. So I went along. <laughs> Agents are fabulous, are they? Give it a go, you know. I can't <laughs> tap dance. Give it a go. <laughs> so I went along and I said, yeah, I'll try it. So I did the first series and it became really popular. Yeah. And I had a good band. And then I did the second and the third, and then I was still doing Parkinson. So I, my daughter called me, Abigail, and she said, Daddy, we never see you. <laughs> I said, well, that's because I'm doing 14 arrangements for Strictly, and I'm doing the write-ons and play-ons for Parky. She said, well, you've got to give one up. I said, mm. which one? She said, well, which is easiest? I said, Parkinson. Yeah. She said, right, give up Strictly. Now, I didn't know that Parkinson was going to stop. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I played a lot more golf after that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad you touched on that because you've hit a really good point there, Laurie, about um, the arrangements. You know, on a show like that, people just think you turn up and play the band. Yeah. There's a lot of work, you know, oh, pre work absolutely. goes in because I guess the format is who picked the da you know, who told you the music? The team pick it. Oh, right. Them there pick it. Yeah. But they pick, say, a Beatles tune. Yeah. Which is four minutes long. Then it, it was sent to a friend of mine who reduced it to one and a half. Everything is one and a half minutes. Yeah. So it's the, the important bit of the tune. Then it's sent to me uh, by an email, and I play it, and I reproduce that one and a half minutes for my band. Yeah. And that's the way it's done all the time. Wow. But the funny thing is the dancers have been rehearsing to the Beatles. Yeah, yeah. And suddenly they're dancing to my tune on the day of the thing, so it's a different sound. Oh. But it's exactly the same tempo and routine, so. And, and Bruce Forsyth, who we always, I mean, I just love Bruce Forsyth, a yeah. brilliant cosmic performer. Um, I, I interviewed him about this, and he said he, he thought it might work, but he said to me he wasn't sure with the celebrity aspect, you know, because Bruce is an entertainer, so yeah. I, I, Bruce could just entertain them. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, he'd yeah. come out, didn't he, on the stage, he'd yeah. dance. And I remember going to a few recordings, and I think he struggled with the fact that they were always rushing him through auto cue. You know, it was like, just yeah, do yeah, this, do yeah. this, you know, because it's telly and they want it condensed and real stuff. Oh, you know, stuff it, I'll do my act, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, so when you were there, I mean, what, what was it like with Bruce? Because he must, I, I, it just makes me laugh. I mean, was he good fun with them? And Well, it was not really his normal. Bruce thing because yeah. he had to read autocue as you yeah. said. Nightmare though. First of all he said, can you make it any bigger? <laughs> <laughs> we all say that Laurie. <laughs> but he was having to read rather than ad lib. Yeah. But he did ad lib quite a bit. Yeah. And he was great. I, uh, he, I think he and I are the only two to leave. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I should imagine so. Yeah. And also when he, when the, because the first winner I think was a newsreader, Natasha Kaplinsky. Natasha. And when you think about that, you know, at that point when you've, you, you've seen this show, I mean, because now it's such a huge worldwide brand. Yeah. And you're right there at the beginning of it. Yeah, you know? yeah, I mean, yeah. that's, that's the it's weird It's all thing. over the world now. Yeah. I mean, do, did you think at that point, this, this could be big, or did you think, oh, might no. come back for another series? I thought it was just another series. Wow. But oh. the BBC sold it yeah. to state, Canada, Australia, everywhere. Yeah. And they're all using the same signature tune. Yeah. So I thought... Whoever wrote, well, I know who wrote it, must be making a fortune. Yeah. But they sold it. It was a oh, buyout. <laughs> yeah, oh, right. So the BBC are making the money, or the publisher. Gosh, you see, again, that's why I think it's very interesting with, with people who make such catchy music. Um, when, you, when they come to you, do you, is it because you think to yourself, 
this will only run a week, you know, one series. So you think, oh, well, I'll take the, this money. And well, then, of course, they own it, don't they? You never know. I mean, imagine Coronation Street. You yeah. might think it will run six weeks or something. Yeah. That's what they said it was going to be, though, didn't they? Just yeah. six weeks. So Eric yeah. Spear wrote the music, so yeah. his family are getting royalties as well. But when I was writing music, London Weekend had their own publisher, mm -hmm. Standard Music or Bucks Music or something. And they, they, it was a 50-50 deal. And royalties are split 50-50. Yeah. It's even now. Blind Date is on again, but they get 50%. Because I suppose they plug it in a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but you, you, you know, it's, and, and ultimately, you never have thought, say, five years ago, Blind Date would come back. That's no, the thing, it did. Isn't eight, it? it did eighteen years, yeah. and then it, off, finished, and yeah. now back again with Paul, Paul the yeah. Greater. And of course, you've worked with, as I say, so many. You've worked with a lot of comedians. I've noticed. Now, you worked with Paul O'Grady, didn't you? As Lily Savage. That's right. I mean, <laughs> that must have been because Paul, to me is a, a very clever man, you yeah. know, he's very, very sharp. An old style, if you like, musical comedian in a way, you yeah, know, in the right, size yeah. of like, um, yeah. you know, Norman Evans and stuff like that. People who dress up like yeah. that, Danny LaRue, and they're not frightened to attack the audience. So no, no. when you were there, did you wonder which way it was going to go every night, you know, when you were... What, with Lily Savage? Yeah, you know. yeah. We did a, a tune once with, um, he said, what key are you going to do it in? I said, B flat. He said, Oh, do it in any key for me. I'll flatten it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just great to have that yeah. wit, isn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And did you, again, realise, I mean, he was quite big, I suppose, when you worked with him, but he's now become like um, almost national treasure status, yeah, hasn't he? Has. Because he's, you know, he started it. The animal thing. And yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. But when he was starting out as Lily, that was quite controversial in a way because yeah. the Liverpoolian scouse yeah. commonness of it Drag all. Thing, you know? yeah. Yeah, and he, he sort of like, people were like, oh dear, you know. But now he's warmed and welcomed, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, you know? he's lovely. Nice is boy. there any, uh, um, I have to ask though, is there anybody that you wished you would have worked with and, and, and sort of MD'd and all that sort of stuff that you didn't get the opportunity, whether they've gone or it just the missed opportunity? Is there anybody in that catalogue that you think, oh... Well, oh. there is one. Oh. Frank Sinatra. I knew you were going to say Frank Sinatra. I was booked to play for Frank Sinatra wow. in 1970. And Gordon Mills, who was the manager of Engelbert and Tom, yeah. and Gilbert O'Sullivan, said, right, I would like you to be musical director for Engelbert. I said, great, I'd love to do it, but I've got to come back to the Albert Hall to do one night with Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Not a bad gig. <laughs> he said, who's the agent for Frank Sinatra? I said, it's Harold Davison Agency. He said, oh, well, you're out. I've just bought that agency. So I never got a chance to play oh. for Sinatra. But that must have been really annoying, though. It because, was. <laughs> yeah, because I think when you really like someone like that, it's just... Well, to play for Sinatra, yeah. At the Royal Albert Hall. Yeah. I mean, incredible. Yeah. I played for Mancini at the Albert Hall. He was, he was good. Yeah. That was oh. with Andy Williams. Yeah. He was lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you're talking about great people, you know, Laurie, yeah. because... Andy Williams, again, it's hard to imagine, such a distinctive voice. Yes, you know, he Straight did. away, he did, you yeah. knew. And he had this um, uh, sort of like a beautiful tenor voice in a pop, what I call, mould. Yeah, he um, was a crooner, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, and he, he looked great, you know, the yeah. fabulous looking. But, I mean, ultimately, when he started singing, you know, can't get used to losing you, you just thought, oh, that's Andy Williams, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So, again, it's sort of like when you look back, do you ever think, do, do you see anybody, I mean, I'd love to know your, your thoughts on, What's somebody like Adele to you? Do you think they're a good singer, or would you want to ever to work with them, or do you think no, these were the greats? And well, I did say never again with Barbara Streisand, or yeah. never, never with Streisand. But all the others have been nice people. Well, they are always nice to the piano yeah. player. <laughs> you can give them a bad time. Yeah, <laughs> I've always loved the sound and the lights in, in showbiz. <laughs> yeah, you know. yeah. It's what we really need. Yeah. So you, now you, you, you're you still as busy as ever, I can see, you know. And it's interesting, we were just talking before we started about how you write music now. You don't need a massive studio, an orchestra. That's right. So, you know, does that, do you like that now, or do you miss that intimacy of all getting together? I used together to love and... going, driving into London, doing 10 to 1 at Pi, yeah. two to five at Decca, and seven till ten at EMI. Wow. Fantastic. With with people like, um, what's it called? Tony Hatch. Was it? Tony Hatch. Yeah. Yeah. What was Pi Records like? Because that was in Marble Arch, wasn't it? Pi. Yeah, it was, was Marble Arch. Yeah. yeah. What was it Street, like right? in there? You know, was it because it seemed to be like a, in a dungeon? Yeah. And, yeah, but they seemed to be churning out mega hits all the time, yeah. didn't they? Was I, it? I did a couple, of, two or three albums there with Cyril Stapleton. 
Oh, who we fondly call Sterile Simpleton. <laughs> <laughs> if only they knew. <laughs> and Nori Paramore, do you remember him? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I'm a little young, but I've heard <laughs> I mean, he did all the Helen Shapiro stuff and stuff like that. That's right, yeah. So, but it's interesting, because you're talking about these people. Those you know, people, producers and arrangers and stuff, they were as big as the stars they were working with, weren't they, at the time, because... Their names, you know, yeah. it's like Nelson Riddle, Nori Paramore, you know, yeah. those sort of people. You, 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 it was a brand you were buying. Thought I'm going to like that because yeah. he's done it. I worked know? with Nelson Riddle with Stefan Capelli and Yehudi Menwin. Right. We did an album. Uh, Stefan was all loose and flowery and lovely. Yeah. Yehudi was like <laughs> 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 Yehudi who? Okay. Yeah. But Nelson Riddle was great. He was lovely, and Stefan was. I was with Stefan for many years. Lovely man. Great violinist. Yeah, yeah. So it's been a good time, really. Have you ever written a book, can I ask? Have you ever put a book together? Well, I, th I think I'm writing one at the moment. Yeah, I've got a ghostwriter yeah. who's um, call calling people up and speaking to the names. Yeah. He hasn't spoken to me yet. <laughs> <laughs> the key factor. Let, let me ask, MBE, I mean, what? You know, I was fascinated. <laughs> when, when we had the lovely Joe Longthorne came here of the yeah. day that he uh, got his award, and he was just floating on cloud nine. Yeah. First of all, when you get that letter, what's that like? Because do you think it's a joke at first? Do you know what you think, eh? Well, I got an idea it was happening because I run a... Uh, my lovely late wife, Marianne, and I started a Montgomery Holloway Music Trust in 1996. And that's why I got the... It's gone. Yeah, it's got sort of the MBE. <laughs> yeah. But when I got the letter, I was a bit disappointed. I thought it should be an O. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest. But what was the day like when you'd go? Is it is it quite nerve wracking? Oh yeah, no, point? it was fantastic. Yeah. I live in Bray in Berkshire, yeah. and it was at Windsor Castle down the road. Oh, I could have so got the bus. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, not very good though. Would you <laughs> meddle and go to the bus? It tails. Oh, so you and you was at Windsor then? You went into Windsor with the Queen. Wow. Because sometimes it's Prince William, sometimes it's Princess yeah. Anne or Prince Charles, but it was the Queen. And I've got a royal story. Can I tell oh, you that? Of course, I'd love to know. Yeah. Well. Princess Margaret was a good friend of Marion and me. Yeah. And she used to come out to the house and do, have her knees up. I think she came at least six times. And she would say who she wanted as guests. She would like to meet stars. And we, we knew yeah. more or less everybody. Anyway, the phone rang one night and, it, and they said it was Princess Margaret. I, I thought, are you sure? <laughs> Could be one of my bass players. I'm going to go. <laughs> but anyway, it was her. She said, are you free? To come to the palace. I said, tomorrow. I said, yes, which palace? She said, Buckingham Palace. I said, fine. What am I coming for? She said, the Queen and I want to sing nursery rhymes that we were taught as children for the Queen Mother's 90th birthday. So, you know, long oh, ago. Well. Yeah. So I went, I said, give me a clue. What, give me, she said, well, we'll be singing, uh, I know where the flies go in wintertime. I said, well, anymore? She said, no, you'll know them all. So I called up chapels immediately, got, got him to bike down. I know where the flies go in wintertime. So I turned up with one piece of music. <laughs> and I said, you'll be pleased to know, ma'am, that I got... She said, it's the wrong one. Oh, no. <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> Oh, God, now that must have... Did you think the tower's looming here? You know oh, what I, I mean? I thought off like, with his head, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chop it off. I mean, that is an incredible thing, you know, from, from where you started... Yeah, you know, if it you is, like, yeah, to, to, yeah. to all the way. To My the, mum and dad would have been proud absolutely of that, yeah. must be thrilled. Like, yeah. I mean, incredible. So I got know. in there, and and the, the queen said, "We have to move rooms because that band's practicing again. <laughs> I'm making a noise." So we went in this room with a piano, a twin mic, and a recording engineer, wow. and we did about 14 tracks. I said, "Look, the best way to do this is you sing it, you two sing it." And I'll get the key in the routine and then and perhaps learn it. So we did that and it was very successful. And we all sat down and listened to it back. And then Princess Margaret came to the house one night. She said it was very, very successful. The Queen Mother loved it. She said, I went, took it in there, and I said, There's a it was a cassette. Yeah. And she said, Well, I don't have any equipment. You'll have to go out and sit in the car. <laughs> so they went and sat in the car <laughs> with this cassette. And then went back in. Prince Charles arrived. He said, I want to hear this cassette. 
She said, well, you have to go and sit in the car. <laughs> he said, why? And he opened the cupboard and she had all this hi-fi gear that <laughs> she'd never opened the cupboard never before. Never seen before. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible, isn't it? It just proves that, you know, whatever we think, I love the royal family, but it proves that, you know, they're just as normal as us, really. They have to do things. Yeah. And it, but, yeah. but when you, 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 talk, you talk about Princess Margaret, were you nervous at first when they came to you? Because I... When you turn up to your house, is it all like that? You're thinking, oh, gosh, you know, have I put enough bleach down the James? I don't you know? No, I wasn't, because she oh. became quite a good friend of ours. Yeah. So it was like somebody, a friend turning up. I always got the feeling, I'd, I'd met Princess Margaret very briefly when I was starting out my career, and uh, I got the feeling that she kind of just loved the world of show business. Yeah, you know, she I did, think yeah. She reminds me, dare I say now, Prince Edward. I think he liked show business. Yeah, I think it's in their family. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, you know, she, in another life, she might have liked to have been a performer or... Yeah. Was that the feeling you I got? first met her at John and Cleo's house. She was a friend of theirs. Yeah. And uh, she was lovely, really. Again, yeah. you had to watch your P's and Q's. Yeah. But take no liberties. And she yeah. was ma'am every time. Oh, really? Even though you were Princess in the... Margaret. Or, or yeah. you'd say Princess Margaret, but you wouldn't say Margaret. Yeah. Off with his head. Do you know, funny, I, I must tell you a funny story. Norman Wisdom, uh, who I loved, you know, and I thought he was a brilliantly funny man, he told me this great story. He was at the palace one day and um, he was having a chat with um, Prince Philip. And uh, apparently, when the Queen was going to enter this room, this band struck up, you know, uh, yeah. to play her in. And Philip said, Norman said, what, what's that? And he said, oh, it's, it's the, the, it must be the Queen. She's arriving. And he said, oh, God, blimey. She can't half play that trumpet. God. <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible thing to say, isn't it? You know, and I said, Do, were you nervous? He said, no, no, you know. And I, I think that's what makes it lovely. I mean, so when, 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 just to recap, when you got your, your um, award and, you, you know, she stands there, what, do, what goes on? Did you, you, you told what to say and everything? Or? I was in a queue. They're all getting gongs. Yeah. And um, <laughs> Gongs. you have to you, you get you get to the head of the line, and there's one person being treated, yeah. whatever it is, and you have to stand next to this bloke, and then you have to go up, bow, and go up and have a conversation with the queen, who knew all about the trust. Yeah, I said you might remember, ma'am, that I played the piano for you and Princess Margaret, and she was taken aback, oh, because she suddenly remembered that who I was. Yeah. So I had to talk about that. She said, it's um, sadly, when the Queen Mother died, they lost the tape. Oh, what a so shame. So it's gone. Yeah, I mean, it's how valuable is that tape when you think about it now? Yeah. And you're part of history, if you're yeah. like, you know. You, but it's really gone. Like, yeah, somebody must have it, though. Well, I yeah. often wonder if the sound man who yeah. was sold to make one copy kept a copy. You know, yeah, you'd like to think in in that respect, you wouldn't mind somebody being a bit tricky, would you? You know no, what I mean? No, no, you'd like, yeah, be very pleased. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't suppose we'll know for a long, long time. Finally, I have to ask Laurie: Is there anything in your career that you haven't done apart from Barbara Streisand or playing for Barbara, <laughs> that you wish that you you know whether it was a film score or writing a big symphony? Or is there anything that you think you know? I wish it had gone down that route a bit more, or that route, you know, because I think we all do, you know. I was pigeonholed into television themes, not films. Yeah. I'd like to have done films. I played piano on a lot of films, yeah. but I never was asked to write film music. Ooh. So that's one thing I yeah. regret. Secondly, I regret not being a better piano player to play heavy classical music, yeah. because some of them are fantastic, you know. Yeah, what do you think to Lang Lang and people like that? I mean, he's incredible. Oh, he's he? fantastic. Yeah, and, and, makes and it, when he's like for, you, he makes it look easy. You know, you They know? play for three hours without yeah. any music. Yeah, just remembering yeah. it. You know, I yes. saw one with Rubenstein, and he, was, he did a concert without music. And they were more encore, encore. And in the end, he said, I want my supper. <laughs> <laughs> Which again just humanizes everybody, doesn't it? Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? You think, well, listen, honestly, Laurie, I could talk to you for hours. I mean, <laughs> you, I really, you'll come back and do more chat, will you? I'd love, love, to, love yeah. to see you again. Thank Laurie you. Holloway, thank you so much for being my guest today. It's been pleasure. a real pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.